Good morning. Welcome to the Alliance for Community Media's Public Policy Summit. I'm Sylvia Strobel, the Executive Director of the Alliance for Community Media. I want to thank the New America Foundation for hosting us here today and providing streaming services so that our members around the country can learn and hear. We have a packed schedule with outstanding panelists and speakers, including FCC Commissioner Michael Copps. Before we begin, I would like to introduce Sasha Meinrath, Director of the New America Foundation's Open Technology Initiative. Sasha is a well-known expert on community wireless networks, municipal broadband, and telecommunications policy. Sasha is a co-founder of Measurement Lab, a distributed server platform for researchers around the world to deploy internet measurement tools, advance network research, and empower the public with useful information about their broadband connections. He also coordinates the Open Source Wireless Coalition, a global partnership of open source wireless integrators, researchers, implementers, and companies dedicated to the development of open source, interoperable, low-cost wireless technologies. Sasha serves on the leadership committee of Comtia Education Foundation, as well as the advisory council for the Knight Commission on the information needs of communities in a democracy. Sasha and his team also worked closely with the ACM recently to publish the white paper, Full Spectrum Community Media, Expanding Public Access to Communications Infrastructure, a copy of which is outside. The paper notes that the key to sustaining community media will be expanding beyond the provision of public access television and participating in the provision of local broadband, operation of radio broadcast licenses, as well as other communications infrastructure. Please join me in welcoming Sasha. Howdy, so welcome to the New America Foundation. We're sort of a public policy think tank located here inside the Beltway. And we cover a, a variety of different areas. So we do a lot with health care reform. We've done a lot with foreign policy analysis. The Open Technology Initiative, which I direct, is sort of the tech telecom arm of our work. But it's also very much focused on media. And if you're like most people, you're thinking, well, what is the connection? And I hope that over the course of the day, you'll see that the technology telecom side of work and the localism, the new media side of the work that all of us are doing are critically important. So my own background comes out of the space that you guys currently inhabit. Uh, I founded and directed uh, something called the Independent Media Center in Urbana-Champaign and one was one of the core organizers for the indie media movement. Spent five years as the treasurer there. So every time there was something going down somewhere in the world, I was the guy responsible for the logistics, the back end of supporting those protests, a lot of the media production from the streets that was happening, et cetera. From that, you could think of it as that was like my activating moment 10 years ago in terms of creating a lot of media from the streets and then looking for places where we could distribute what we had, what we had documented. And that led me very quickly into a lot of the PEG access, local access, TV access space, as well as to, into the internet space. And I've always viewed them as sort of flip sides of the same coin, both vitally important, but also under constant threat. So in Illinois, I was one of the people that was pushing back against a lot of the U-verse uh, fiascos, as they've turned out to be, uh, and have been systematically critical of the attempts by, and now the successful attempts by the Illinois legislator, le legislature to really sort of shut down or marginalize local access. And in all of this work over the last 10 years, I always kind of felt like we're doing amazing work on the ground. We are doing phenomenal work on the ground all across the country. And yet, at the top here in DC, there's this massive disconnect, a real shift away from diversity and localism and the kind of important work that should be supported through our national policies. And so, for me, after connecting a lot of these dots together, Back in 2007, I kind of made the leap to kind of come inside the belly of the beast uh, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, 
But part of what we kept with us, part of the way that the Open Technology Initiative is in fact created has always been to keep at least one of our three feet directly in local communities, local organizing, in the kind of work that you guys do day in and day out. Because we think that is vitally important to the future of democracy here in the United States and abroad. And so I will end by simply saying that the experience that you have is invaluable. It is critical if we're going to win the battles that we fight here inside the Beltway. And I hope that over the course of this day, that you will both glean a lot of useful information in terms of here's how these policies are going to directly impact the work that all of you do. But I also hope that I and the other experts that are up here will glean a lot about what's happening on the ground in all of your lives. And that by the time we get to pints later on this evening, we might be able to, to sit down and grab a couple cocktail napkins and strategize about how we can actually improve the flow of information, the flow of communication, the efficacy of our lobbying and of the work that we're doing here and on the ground. And so I'll close by simply saying that I feel like we are, and I think you know this is often overused, but we are definitely at a critical juncture. We're at a point in time where the FCC where the FTC, where a number of different key agencies are reconsidering what it means to support localism, support media diversity, support public interest obligations, themes that have been coming up, coming up, coming up again and again and again, and where the decisions that are made over the next six months to a year are going to reverberate for the next 10, 20, two generations. And so, in many ways, the work that we're doing here today is laying a foundation for collaboration, laying the groundwork for the battles that we absolutely will be fighting and must win if there is going to be a meaningful future to local community across the country. So I'm going to turn this over now, I think, to Tom. Is that correct? Tom. All right, I'm turning it back over to Sylvia. Uh, but please make yourselves at home. I really look forward to meeting you and learning about the work that you're doing. And I look forward to learning over the course of this day. So thank you very much. Thanks, Sasha. And I just want to thank Sasha and all his colleagues here at New America for the work that they did on our white paper earlier this year. Um, it's been an, an incredible, it was an incredible amount of work on their part. Um, but I think it's really given our members um, a new kind of reason to, to really rally. And, and, and it really, I think, brought out the, the critical importance of community media as well as the future of community media and where we need to go. It's now my privilege to introduce the moderator of our first panel, Tom Glazier, Knight Media Policy Fellow for the New America Foundation. Tom coordinates the media policy program at the New America Foundation's Open Technology Initiative. Tom? Thank you, Sylvia. Um, I'd like to invite the panelists to come up uh, to the stage. And uh, you'll notice on the screen is uh, image of one of the panelists it's 6 a.m. or 6 30 a.m. in California fortunately it's, he's not in uh, in Hawaii otherwise it would be uh, a little even a little earlier um, Aloha nonetheless ah he is here um, so the purpose of this panel is to cover national public policy the sort of policies that the policies that surround uh, the core policies in which you may be more interested in, but it, it's important to, to look at these policies because they set a context for the, the space in which you're operating. And uh, I have an excellent set of uh, panelists here who will discuss the various elements. Now, we're hoping to cover net neutrality, universal service, LPFM, and media ownership, and because that's not enough to cover in one hour, <laughs> um, and there's some movement on rights of way uh, that's come out of the National Broadband Plan that is, has some uh, plays into your your world, and also some work on some tax uh, and cell phones. Um, we'll add those into the agenda as well. So we have 62 minutes. I have six panelists, and I'm hoping to get to some questions and make this pretty interactive. Um, so this is going to be a, a, a fast run. Uh, 
panel and if you see a hook coming out of my arm and uh, hooking them off the stage and uh, moving things on, uh, please, I apologize in advance. Um, when I discussed the panel with Sylvia, her advice was to make it digestible and present these topics in a way that's relatively, for people who are relatively unfamiliar, who want to get a, just a grasp on these issues. Um, and I fully expect the, the panelists to, to do that, but we will cover the topics quickly. Just as by way of saying how I came to this, I spent a lot of time working on the uh, full spectrum community media paper. Uh, and more recently, I've been working with Rob McCausland, who some of you may know, on his community media database.org map, which is doing it, uh, making an effort to mapping community media, not just LPFM, but uh, uh, not just uh, community media centers, but also LPFM and other outlets. And as a way to sort of catalog what's there, because if we do that, we can help help each other build a stronger community media sector. And I am, for one, I think this is incredibly important, uh, and there is a great opportunity to do more of that. So we're going to go down the panelists, actually, almost as they're, as they're ordered with Sean popping in towards the end. Um, I'll start with uh, Corey Wright, who uh, is from Free Press, has worked long and hard on media policy issues. Um, and I've asked her to, to give us an overview of media ownership and perhaps also touch a little bit on the AT&T T-Mobile merger that's in the news and that given the uh, potential consolidation of the market there and the way AT&T U-verse has been playing out, I think is probably interesting to you. But we'll start with the media ownership and where we are, where are we on the, on the quadrennial review and what is the quadrennial review? Sure. Well, I will try to do this as succinctly as I can. Um, media ownership issues preventing excessive consolidation has been a signature issue for the media reform community for a long time now. The, the core concept is to make sure that you have local owners who are locally responsive to the community and provide programming that community needs. Um, you know, for a very long battle against extreme odds in terms of political power and lack of capital, this community has been extraordinarily successful. There was a move to try to relax the rules in 2002. We went to court and we prevailed. Uh, in 2007, there was another effort to relax the rules. And just this July, uh, a court once again ruled in favor of public interest parties that the FCC had failed to justify its rationale for relaxing some of its rules. Um, some of the opportunities and challenges that we face as we are now entering another quadrennial media ownership review, the FCC has to review its rules every four years, um, is that we have some great opportunities and some great challenges, I think. Number one is the internet. And the internet is a magnificent tool and it's expanded opportunities. I apologize in advance. We have had some connectivity problems with Sean. I and I <laughs> um, sorry, but Sean is now back. But uh, well. sorry about that. Um, so uh, the internet, while an amazing tool that expands people's horizons and opportunities to participate in the context of local media issues, tends to give the appearance of abundance of diversity and competition, which is. You go online, there's a plethora of sources. Why does media ownership at the local level still matter? Well, study after study, as well as anecdotal evidence, shows that local newspapers and local broadcast stations are still the major providers of local news for communities. And frequently, what you read online is the website of your local broadcaster or your local newspaper. Or it, are, it is sites that are sourcing from your local newspaper and broadcaster and are commenting on it, which is incredibly worthwhile, but it's different than uh, investigative journalism. Um, and so while we have this appearance of abundance, local media issues and media ownership remains incredibly important. The second challenge I think we are facing as we go into this next quadrennial review is that many broadcasters are engaging in what we call covert consolidation, that is, Broadcasters that could not merge because of media ownership rules in very small communities are instead entering into contractual arrangements which they say is not ownership, but pretty much look exactly like it. You have stations that have completely consolidated their operations, they're jointly producing news. In some cases, they're actually simulcasting newscasts. From a perspective of efficient, efficient use of the spectrum, uh, consolidation and useful information for the community, we think that this is really a step backwards 
and something that we're going to be confronting um, this next review. I'd say that the last thing that is a real challenge for our community in the review is exhaustion. This happens every four years, and it is very difficult to keep up energy and focus. Additionally, Commissioner Cox, who will be speaking here later today, has been an amazing champion for this and has really rallied the troops, and his term is going to be ending <coughs> later this year. I think it's incumbent upon everyone who cares about this issue to maintain their energy because it does still matter and it may matter even more than ever. Um, and I don't want to take up too much time, I will very, very briefly touch on the AT&T T-Mobile merger, um, just to say that consolidation can, can affect us in all different sectors. This is potentially one of the largest mergers that we have on our docket where you'd have two companies at the end of it if it was consummated. Uh, Verizon and AT&T controlling a, an immense portion of the wireless market. The Department of Justice has filed suit that will be uh, taking its course. The FCC as well has jurisdiction to review the merger. And um, I think we have a lot of different areas that we're going to have to remain vigilant on in terms of consolidation as we go forward in the next few months. Great. Thank you, Corey. That's, uh Impressive uh, ground cover in about four minutes. Um, I suspected, mm -hmm. Je if I was in your seat uh, and uh, don't work on these issues day to day, there will be some words in what Corey has said and what uh, Brandy will say in a moment that will elicit questions. And I encourage you, and I will make sure we have time for questions. So please store them away and don't be afraid to ask the meaning of a word or clarification on a particular point. Now. Brandy Doyle is in a, a slightly different uh, part of the, the media policy world uh, about working for Prometheus on the LPF on LPFM, which is a happier story at the moment. Um, now, nothing is ever completely joyous, but there is there is some good news uh, there uh, and some progress and some activity going on. And I'll turn to Brandy to explain what that is. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so. The biggest policy news in the world of low power FM community radio is the recent passage of the Local Community Radio Act. Can you raise your hand if you're familiar with the Local Community Radio Act? That's m most people, not everyone. Um, so this is legislation uh, recently passed that expands opportunities for low power FM radio. And it's, um, it was a long time coming. It was more than a uh, 10 year um, bipartisan grassroots struggle to pass the Local Community Radio Act. And I think there's probably lessons for this community that I'd be happy to chat with folks afterwards about the, the work that was done to pass, um, to pass the bill. Um, there was a broad co coalition of organizations from um, grassroots groups to uh, beltway groups civil rights organizations, emergency responders, religious groups, and um, we use a variety of tactics over a long time to, um, to push against uh, mostly the commercial broadcast lobby to um, pressure Congress into passing this legislation that um, releases, uh, removes restrictions on the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, that allow them to license new low power radio stations in more cities across the country. So previously these stations were limited mostly to rural areas and now they're gonna be allowed uh, in a, many more communities, medium and large cities for the first time ever. So this is a, a new opportunity for community radio stations and it's an opportunity that um, uh, is available to public access and uh, TV stations. and. And I think that it's a great opportunity. And the white paper that uh, the New America Foundation put out talks about this um, as an opportunity for building uh, community-controlled infrastructure. And I think it's a really good one. I think public access TV stations are great candidates for low-power radio stations. Low-power stations are small, non-commercial. They have to be locally owned. Uh, you can only own one. Uh, and they're only licensed to nonprofit organizations, local governments, uh, religious groups, and um, and they have restrictions, they're non-commercial, they have restrictions on underwriting, and they're really, the licenses themselves uh, are provided at no cost by the FCC. Um, and the opportunity to apply for them is coming soon, though we don't know exactly when. The, one of the other lessons from the Local Community Radio Act, um, you know, people say everything's in implementation, and 
implementation is ongoing right now. There's a couple of rulemaking procedures at the FCC that have to be completed um, to implement the bill before there's an opportunity to apply for new stations. So um, right now we're waiting on the FCC to complete implementation and they have said that the earliest they expect the opportunity to apply for new low power stations to be uh, next summer. That's, that's an optimistic estimate. It could be sometime after that. Um, but it's important for organizations who are interested in applying for low power stations to, do so, to start preparing now uh, because when they do open an application window, the filing window is, uh, the last one that they did was five days long. So it's not a long window. You have to be prepared well in advance. Um, there are a number of public access TV stations around the country that have, that already run uh, low power FM stations. Is there anybody in the room that works with a low power FM radio station? Full power. Or full power? Or Great. So yeah, I encourage you, if you're interested in this opportunity, to also talk to your colleagues about the, how that's worked. Um, in their communities. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. Just, I guess, two quick notes for this community. I would, two things. One, I, was, uh, I would encourage um, your organizations to look into applying for a station and thinking about how that might expand your operations and your community involvement and your community support. Um, and two, whether or not you're interested in applying, I would encourage you to think about how you can use the channel and the outlet that you already have to spread the word about this opportunity in your community to other organizations who might be interested. Uh, we have a limited amount of time to spread the word about this opportunity all over the country, and it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a one-time only opportunity to build community media infrastructure because the, the FM spectrum is crowded. We don't expect another opportunity of this size to come along again. It's been a hard-won opportunity over a long time, and um, and when it, you know, when it passes, it will pass. So we encourage everyone who has access to media infrastructure today to think about how they can use the tools they have, maybe even the meeting space that you have for other organizations to come in and um, host a community meeting to think about uh, you know, what, how your community could be served by a, a new radio station. Thank you. Thank you, Brandy. And so after the uh, offer of a once in a lifetime opportunity uh, from Brandy, we'll turn to Ben. Um, ben, you're gonna deal with some more I suppose complex, there's some com complex and technical terms in, in what you'll be discussing. Um, so have you identified for net neutrality, uh, universal service reform, and uh, potentially the rights of way? So um, maybe you didn't feel you have to keep to my like five, five minutes, but um, net neutrality, what does it mean? Where are we? Uh, and uh, what does the future look like? Um, <coughs> well. So we had a net neutrality order that was put out, uh, I guess, a year ago or so, or over a year, I guess, December. Uh, it seems like a long time ago. <laughs> and, uh, you know, as many folks are probably aware, you know, we've, we fought for years and years and years for the FCC to move forward with, you know, fundamental protections to protect the free flow of information, to prevent companies from charging uh, content providers for access. Um, and we got an order finally uh, in December. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the protections were rather weak uh, on the wireline side for wired uh, broadband. Uh, you know, we had some okay protections, but a lot of loopholes in there. Uh, and then on the mobile side, which they completely split them up separately, uh, there were virtually no protections. In fact, companies can still continue to block access to certain applications and content. Uh, and there's really no recourse uh, for consumers or protections. So uh, the commission then sat on the order for a while, um, uh, and uh, finally, uh, you know, basically was taking their time submitting it to the Federal Register and, and uh, through the various processes. Uh, meanwhile, in Congress, uh, in the House, they passed a resolution of disapproval uh, basically revoking the rules and the FCC's authority over broadband. Um, finally, sometime after that, the FCC finally submitted the rules for review by... I forget, what's the so, a clarification, oh, they passed the resolution of disapproval in the House. What does that mean? Uh, for the moment, it means nothing. Uh, it, it's a nice grandstanding uh, effort by the uh, Republicans. Um, there's another effort underway in the Senate right now, which a number of public interest groups are trying to stop. Uh, 
obviously the Senate has, uh, with the Democrats and the majority, it's less likely, um, though uh, it's still a significant effort by a lot of groups to try to prevent uh, particularly Senate, you know, any Senate Democrats from going, signing, you know, basically advocating for the FCC to have no authority over broadband and be against net neutrality. So uh, it's still a significant effort. Uh, and then after it, if assuming it got through the Senate, it would need to be, uh, you know, signed into law by the President, which would be highly unlikely at this point. So you have that process going on underway, and then the rules finally uh, have passed OMB review. Uh, they were published a, a, like a month ago. Uh, and now the fun part, uh, which is the various court challenges that will happen as a result. Uh, so public interest groups uh, filed in a couple of different uh, district courts or appellate courts of various around the country, uh, and uh, Verizon, uh, sued as well and filed in the district in the DC circuit. Uh, there was a lottery, uh, and the DC circuit won. Uh, and the issue with the DC circuit is is, is generally has a history of being rather anti-regulation, uh, and they were the ones that struck down uh, the BitTorrent uh, ruling at the FCC, saying the FCC didn't provide adequate authority. Uh, they've generally been. Uh, they are also the they were the brand X. Uh, that was Ninth Circuit. Oh, that was Ninth Circuit. Okay, come on. Uh, and so. Um, Don't go there. Don't go to brand X. <laughs> <laughs> so Sean um, is is here in the the internet ether. So uh, um, so it w it will be a significant challenge for the FCC to to defend its authority, uh, and I don't won't go into all the details of Title One and Title Two, but generally the. The authority that they're resting on for the uh, open internet rules is is very uncertain at the moment. Uh, so there is a chance that the dish, the DC Circuit could overturn the rules, and then we're left uh, with no net neutrality rules, as well as potentially questions around whether the FCC has any authority to regulate broadband at all. And and those challenges have come both from Verizon and from <coughs> public interest groups. So why the public interest groups? Uh, public interest groups uh, were. Uh, wanted to sort of intervene and, and, and raise the concern over the, uh, the sort of difference between wireline and wireless. Uh, there's, you know, they're basically completely arbitrary distinctions made by the commission, uh, and they did not provide adequate justification for uh, uh, creating basically two different rules for what, is, what essentially now is one internet. Uh, and in fact, the chairman at the beginning of that process said that he, you know, it's one internet, and then suddenly at the end you had completely different rules for uh, whether you access the internet uh, via, a, via wireline service or via your mobile device. Uh, and so uh, consumer and public interest groups have challenged that uh, arbitrary decision by the commission uh, to, to, to impose those, those different rules. Right, thanks. That's, so that's net neutrality. Enough net neutrality, so we got through that uh, one. USF. Basically, uh, the USF fund, as most folks probably know, is it's used, it has been used primarily to subsidize phone service, uh, the build out of phone service in rural areas. Uh, so there's been uh, a lot of effort and, and discussion around transitioning that fund to fund broadband, um, as well as discussions around um, intercarrier compensation, which is basically the amount that each phone company has to pay to connect to another phone company's calls. And, if I connect, call a rural company, if I try to call a rural cu customer, my phone company pays the rural, rural telephone provider a certain fee. And uh, generally, it's been used as a means for the rural telephone companies to subsidize their basically business, uh, as well as getting subsidies from the Universal Service Fund. Uh, and so the SEC put out an order uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, not an order, but an NPRM. And, um, We've gone through several iterations, and then uh, finally the big telcos and the rural telcos came out with their own plan called the ABC plan, uh, which would basically uh, completely re transform the ICC uh, intercarrier compensation uh, pricing, but also uh, 
direct all of the money for a new Connect, Connect America fund for broadband to the existing telephone companies uh, that have been receiving subsidies. I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, and as well as wanting to remove uh, all sorts of public interest obligations on themselves. Uh, the chairman actually came out with a speech uh, last week, um, basically uh, indicating that uh, they would, it seems, uh, implement certain parts of the ABC plan, but uh, not implement certain other parts. Uh, so essentially, what it seems like it's going to, ha what, what's going to happen is they're going to implement intercarrier compensation reform. Uh, so that will mean for the rural telephone companies, most likely less money coming into them. Uh, as a result of that, uh, many of those companies have asked that the commission that they would be able to raise the subscriber line charge. So there's a basic charge uh, on phone service um, to make up for that lost revenue, uh, which is a big concern to a lot of public interest and consumer groups, because you know most of these consumers of most wireline uh, current sort of basic telephone service provide you know uh, consumers are low income they're seniors uh, and they really can't afford to have sort of a significant price increase and also there is just no evidence that the companies would actually need to raise that basic uh, line charge with ICC reform or with um, you know the Connect America fund so you know, we've been very much asking the commission not to sort of authorize sort of this across the board uh, uh, pass for all of these companies to raise prices for consumers uh, on data that hasn't been proven out yet. We don't know what the, what the, what the financial structure is going to look like once the reform has taken place. The other issue with the Connect America Fund is uh, because the commission's sort of Title I, Title II authority is so weak and they're unsure about broadband, they may take the easy pass and just give the money to the existing telephone companies um, because rather than trying to figure out whether they can give it to new entities, uh, they may sort of, at least uh, in the short term, give it to the, rural, the existing uh, rural telephone companies to expand broadband access. Uh, Is that the high cost fund? Is that the high cost fund parallel? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, public interest groups are trying to sort of, again, make sure there's accountability. Uh, also, uh, we have been advocating a lot for in an interconnection obligation. So the broadband stimulus uh, grants were required to provide interconnection. Uh, we think that that's a very basic minimal obligation that should be imposed on these companies that are receiving taxpayer uh, dollars. So that's the Connect America Fund. Uh, there's also reforms to Lifeline LinkUp, which is sort of the consumer side of USF, which subsidizes telephone service. It's like a $10 subsidy to consumers. Uh, so there's ongoing discussion around transitioning that to, or allowing consumers to actually also subsidize broadband, um, as well as how many, uh, how, how many in each household should be eligible uh, you know, so for example, uh, Lifeline LinkUp subsidizes mobile service a lot, um, but if it's only, you know, the one adult in the household and they take the mobile phone with them, then the rest of the family doesn't have mobile, uh, doesn't actually have telephone access, uh, and there's ongoing discussions whether it should be one per household or one per adult or uh, various things. Uh, unfortunately, it seems that uh, the commission was rather quick to assert uh, early on that, in fact, clarifying that in, under the current rules that households are only allowed to receive one benefit per household. Uh, and unfortunately, that they uh, imposed that uh, rather quickly. And uh, at the moment, uh, currently, households are only eligible for one coupon uh, for service. Right, so you have a service fund. It's not perhaps as, may not be as core to your public access work, but USF, <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, but uh, right of way. Um, ben, if you can give a quick overview of the sort of big issue and then we'll pivot to Mitzi and Sean to talk about it from the perspective of a community uh, TV station. So um, sort of buried in the national broadband plan was this recommendation that the FCC should uh, do a review of uh, local and state rights of way policies. Um, I, 
do I need to explain rights of way? Actually, I'd rather make you explain the rights of way policies. But um, <laughs> generally speaking, uh, so we had flagged this as sort of a really sort of uh, head scratcher as well as a potential for uh, a real sort of dangerous road that the FCC would go down. Um, it's clear that the carriers and the cable companies and various uh, other broadband providers have been pushing for this for a while. So the FCC finally, uh, uh, earlier this year, put out a notice of inquiry on rights of way policy, proposing a series of pretty aggressive questions around whether they should, you know, do sort of standardized practices and really framing it in terms of the states and localities standing in the way of broadband deployment and access. Um, and um, it is just the notice of inquiry, um, but it sort of sets the stage for a potential of notice of proposal rulemaking. Uh, we uh, filed, along with uh, Public Knowledge Media Access Project and Access Humboldt, uh, basically uh, opposing the FCC uh, intervening uh, and um, sort of uh, attempting to insert itself in authority where states and localities are the, are the proper entity to be in charge. Uh, and as of right now, it's sort of just kind of sitting there, um, but I think Mitzi can handle more of just push back on the idea itself. Great. Thanks, Ben. That's a tour de force. Um, so now we'll move to Mitzi and Sean. Sean, are you there? Aloha. Yeah, I'm still here. Fantastic. So Sean uh, is in the dark ether. So we, as you notice, we've had some connectivity problems, so we're not going to have, we'll have him only on voice, but he will come out of the ceiling. Um, so I think we'll start with, with Sean and then Mitzi. Um, both of you uh, come from PEG stations, uh, and, or PEG more generally. Um, and Sean, do you want to give us your perspective as a, from Access Humboldt? I know that you're, uh, you are actually filed suit in, uh, up in, is it the Ninth Circuit? Ninth yes, circuit. we were we were hoping that the open net rules would be in the Ninth Circuit. So perhaps if you could perhaps talk about the issues that you've heard today from your perspective, and perhaps touch on the net neutrality to bring it uh, bring it home. Okay, I'll, uh, I, I'm just imagining for folks in the room who haven't sort of looked at the broad scope, this uh, a lot of ground has been covered. So. I think part of my message is to say, um, take advantage of New America Foundation and all the resources around you. Obviously, there's a lot of brain power there and some amazing folks uh, in the room and MADCO. And um, so while well, you're, uh, I just want to encourage folks to take advantage of those opportunities. And I, I heard Sasha remind us of the two key phrases out of the federal law, which are localism and diversity. And for access folks, we have to communicate across a lot of different um, policy makers and non-policy makers in our work all the time. So having really simple ways to talk about it I think is important to me. And localism and diversity are, are two easy concepts that we clearly, the community media uh, clearly addresses the most directly compared to any other outlet that's available. So the human rights framework the idea of um, really Article 19 of the Declaration of Human Rights is really helpful conceptually um, as well. So uh, when, I, when I was listening to the ownership part, I'm thinking for us to remember our place across media, you got satellite, broadcast, cable, and telecom, really, and each have grown up in a different kind of regulatory framework, um, but we're all related in a sense, and each, one, each area of media has a different uh, jurisdiction that has a different role to play, the federal jurisdictions, tribal, state, local, and we tend to be very familiar with the local jurisdictions and the frustration of being preempted by state and federal, but um, I think it's a constructive framework to think about engaging any one of those jurisdictions in a way to harmonize with the other jurisdictions. So for example, when you're talking to people in Congress, you can be talking about how to make better use of local resources 
and the public investments that are being made at the state and local levels. And um, I think what's in common across all of the media and all of the issues that have been presented is this idea that um, public benefits, we, we really need to address uh, mitigating harms and maximizing public benefits that derive from very essential public assets of rights of way and spectrum. I mean, if it wasn't for public ownership uh, and maintenance of rights of way and public ownership and regulation of spectrum, we wouldn't have a lot to hang our hat on. But uh, if you look at those two core assets that we have, the rights of way and the spectrum, um, and how those interests sort of underlie uh, what happens with over the air with the satellite, um, with broadcast, uh, on the ground with cable and telephone. And it, it, to me, it's been a very helpful way to just distill it down to in very simple terms. Look, our community has an interest in the right of way. We all paid to acquire and maintain that right of way. We're the ones impacted by that tower site appearing in our neighborhood. Um, we may not have a lot to say about spectrum, but we have a lot to say about right of way. When you're talking to people at the federal level, spectrum issues become more prominent. Um, but the essential ask, I think, stays the same. So the essential ask that I think we need to keep in mind is one that the ACM Public Policy Group tried to outline, you know, many years ago. And it's to me, it distills down to a very simple concept. We're asking to set aside capacity, um, spectrum, uh, channel bandwidth, and put it under local control and with a mechanism that provides operating funding for that to make use of that capacity. So whether it's satellite broadcast, cable, telecom, broadband, internet, whatever it is, we want capacity that's set aside under local control with a funding mechanism that uh, makes it usable and accessible in local communities to address localism and diversity. So that's my, that's my two cents. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Um, Mitzi, you aren't in California. You're from Montgomery County, just up the street. I'm from California. Oh, but I thought you were... <laughs> But, but I do work you do work here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, thank you for having me here. Um, I do want to actually thank most of the, the folks in this room um, for filing comments in the right-of-way proceeding at the FCC. Um, and I was remarking on how far we had come since um, many years ago uh, there was a bill in Congress and uh, one of our partners supported, one of the public interest partners supported statewide franchise, our national franchising. So we've really come a long way and it was very gratifying to see the comments that were filed by uh, New America Foundation, Free Press, Public Knowledge, Media and Democracy, and Access Humble. Um, so let me, um, let me sort of say, I, I was looking at this and what Sean had asked me to do was, uh, I'll say a little bit about the taxes, but to sort of sort of suggest on all of these issues what either the local benefit, the local government or the pu public interest, uh, PEG interest is in these. And in listening to this, I think that one of the ways to really, um, I guess there's two points to take away from this, is one is it's all about money. And the two is in, in this town, we're big on talk, short on details, and we don't have any way to deal with unintended consequences. And that is why we end up in this kind of paralysis and strange bedfellows environment. So in, let me just start with the taxes. Um, and, and, and I guess it sort of plays in with the right of way too. Fundamentally, this is all about how do you fund these things? And if you, do, you can't raise taxes at the local level to fund local projects, local community infrastructure, local media, then you're dead in the water. And you end up with a national model in which everything is the same for everyone. So that's why these things matter. What's important to realize too is that we're losing on the tax front. Um, and that's a big thing because in this environment, everybody is all about, well, let's not have taxes, let's lower taxes, let's do all those things, but those fund those services. So the one bill right now that we're really looking at is the bill um, 
it's it's got a bill in both the House and the Senate version, and it would prevent discriminatory cell phone taxes, which sounds great. Um, but what that means is in a lot of local communities, they have taxes that exist on wire on wireline telephones. And they don't have a lot of taxes that exist on wireless. In fact, the federal government's got probably more on, on, on both of those than, than state and local governments. Um, and there's no bills getting rid of the federal taxes, I might note. Um, but what the new bills would do is it would say, okay, well, you can't impose a discriminatory tax on a cell phone. So if you wanted to say that cell phones should now pay the same in taxes, as landline phones, that would be prohibited. But in most cases, and people have seen, people are moving to having only cell phones, not landlines, and in part because the FCC has not finished all these things they're talking about, intercarrier compensation, other things that essentially are the cost to not use your phone. You can look at your phone bill and you'll see them. Um, that is sort of stuck there. And so at the local government level, and for the PEG, why we care about that is that um, that's a place where you can generate um, funding that funds all of these other vital programs that you're needing to pick up. And local governments are being hit doubly because at the same time, the federal government is reducing the money that they're giving back to local communities, and states are reducing back the money that you look, look at that uh, are coming back to local communities. And if you then say, well, you can't collect any fees or taxes on what happens in your local community, then you're just trying to say, well, we're not going to fund any of this. And the free model will only work so long. The, um, the important thing about that bill is it's sponsored by a Democrat out of California, and it's got over 200 co-sponsors. So if you look at that in comparison to what we're doing, it's, it's, um, that's the kind of big picture that we're up against. On the, the, in addition, there is Congress passed the Internet Tax Freedom Act, which has got to get the winner for best name. Um, and what that bill does is it says, okay, for these ISPs who are out here use public property, um, you cannot charge them taxes or fees, period. That is a moratorium that has been extended. It uh, will not sunset until 2014. And so what that means is that uh, local governments uh, can collect money, franchise fees for cable providers. They can provide money for PEG. But you cannot collect any fees for people who use, those same companies who use the right of way, to provide broadband services. And in a lot of states, you have a problem in which the incumbent telephone company was there either at the time or before they became a state and got the right to use the right of way at a time when um, they were the only company and so they weren't paying anything. And so now when you have people who come in who are CLEX competitors who are only serving certain parts of your community and you want to charge them or you want to charge the ILEC, then you can't do it. So again, there's no money to fund these things unless you fundamentally address those. On the, um, on the specific issues that have come forward on the right of way, um, the, the most likely what's going to happen on the FCC, it was very interesting. There were very few comments that people filed really looking at right of way, at the, at the, the wire line services that are in the ground. That was very surprising um, to a lot of us. Who knows exactly what that means because we've certainly had ones where out of the blue something else came up and there's something else called level three. Um, at, at the FCC and they're looking at that. So that's something to watch. What's more likely to happen is the FCC will come out and look at rules about tower siting and they'll probably focus on co-locations. In part, it's because they feel like it's something that they can do. Um, what they're not doing are um, things like the pole attachment order, which you know sounds so sexy, pole attachments. But in fact, if you're into um, expanding access, pole attachments are the sexiest thing out there. Okay, because the single biggest obstacle to expanding competitive broadband is you either have to go underground, which can be expensive, or you have to go on the poles, and there's not enough room on the poles. So the FCC created rules in which people want to get access to the poles. They come, and the chairman touts this thing, and it's all great, great, great. And what does it say? It says, okay, you, when you go and you ask for permission to get on the pole, they have a certain amount of time that they have to respond back to you. But there's this thing called make ready work. You have to make that pole ready. And in a lot of cases, it means you've got to put in a new pole because you need a taller pole. There's no timeline to get that work done. That's what the FCC has under reconsideration. And instead of focusing on that, we're talking about towers. In, the, in this filing, I appreciate everybody who, who went and, and did it. We went and we looked up some numbers. There are something like uh, 200,000, over 200,000 facilities that 
the um, industry uses. There were complaints about 76 of them filed in that proceeding. There are uh, 39, I think it's 39,000 municipalities in the U.S. There were complaints filed about 700 of them. Uh, this, in any sense, where you only have complaints in which 99% of America is not having a problem does not seem to be where you should have the focus. But that is, in fact, where the FCC is having its focus because it's easy, because it's easy to come after local governments, it's easy to come after public interest. On the, um, on the net neutrality, I mean, I have to say, frankly, thank goodness for net neutrality because if it wasn't for net neutrality, we would have national franchising of cable. People don't remember that when the COPE Act came out, people wanted to talk about net neutrality, and people remember that um, Senator Stevens had his things about pipes. It's a pipe, what kind of pipe? John Stewart did a whole thing. Got people in the, in, the, in the public excited about technology issues and keep your hands off my internet and those kinds of things. And so the bill died because people weren't willing to make a deal. So on the net neutrality now, where at the local level, on one hand, um, we, what we see is that it's, you, you want to have networks that you open up because these are streets and roads and there's a lot of, of, of cost that goes in to both maintaining those and also having to put in those new facilities and so it would make sense to share. But nobody's come up with a good way to say, well, how do I actually make sure that the person who, the company that invested the money in building that infrastructure to everywhere versus the competitor that comes along and says, I only want to buy what I need, that there's some way to equalize that. And at the local government level, a lot of folks are using institutional networks, INETs, to um, provide services to schools and library places where we can get broadband. And for in Montgomery County, we use that for our, our um, PEG channels. We, we do that video stream. We carry that over that. You do, we don't want to open up that network necessarily, because when we built it, we did not build it for commercial capacity. So that becomes another issue and, and how you, you sort of marry that. But on the concept that people should share, I mean, we have Verizon. Verizon's got tons of conduit that they put in there. They won't lease it out because they think, look, hey, we're, we, we might need it later on. Um, on the Universal Service Fund, um, again, you know, for us, it, I mean, what's amazing is it, it is difficult, it is complicated, but if you look at the number of years, I mean, this is part of the problem. We're so afraid at the federal level to make any decision because it might be wrong, we might have imperfect information, or it might have unintended consequences that nothing happens. So here we are in 2011, and we have a fund which doesn't provide services for broadband, and we, we have a plan that says if you're a household, you have to pick. You can either have low-cost telephone or low-cost broadband, but we won't give you both, which is astounding in its stupidity. So, but, but that's kind of where we're at. Why? Because there's no money in the fund to do both. On the low power FM, uh, on that piece, it, it is an interesting thing. In some ways, it comes at a terrible time because at the time that local governments have been really trying to stretch their budgets, they have been doing costs to be able to partner with some of our local par partners to um, either provide funding or to provide startup or to provide matching grants, those kinds of things. Um, that is difficult. The NOI on tower siting is relevant because in most of these cases, unless that station already exists and you already have a transmitter tower, you're going to have to figure out how to do that. And instead of us spending time looking at ways that we can partner with industry to figure out where we need to have more towers, what we could do to be rezoning, we're spending time filing comments at the FCC to say that when you have a tower that has six things on it, you shouldn't have a by right rule that says that you can put another six things on it that actually looking at whether that tower is rated to, to do it is a, good, is a good thing. So that's going to play in there. And then the last thing really is on media ownership. It would say that um, beyond just the consumer impact that we care about, because people call to, up to us and complain all the time about things at a local level, we have no power or authority to fix. Um, but the, bi the biggest problem for that is that as these companies consolidate, it makes it harder to get a local deal that recognizes the, the things that are in the local community um, that are different from another place. It makes it harder to do things where you can't show an absolute bottom line that can be reported on a quarterly basis. And the last thing I would say is that even, although it, it tends to come up as an issue for smaller markets, it's a problem in larger markets too. In the D.C. area, 
Um, there are four million people who live in that metro market. And so the ability to get local news on four mainstream commercial channels and even and when you look at the budgets that are cut on the public television and the, and the radio broadcasting, um, partnerships are going to be the way that it has to happen, but it's coming at a time when it's, it's really hard to find partners at the local government level um, and haven't seen any models yet that show how our nonprofit partners can really get into that. But I think that there is a need, there is a support, and I think talking about the localism and the ability to get out local information in a local area um, is probably the winning strategy there. Thank you, Mitzi. You covered pretty much everything. Um, so, Tom, Tom uh, yes? this is Sean. I just want to highlight um, one quick phrase that Mitzi brought up that I think is critical, and that is community anchor institution. Um, in terms of broadband deployment, in terms of the concepts of information access, uh, that's becoming a very important concept that media, community media is already central to and needs to embrace as a, as a frame, community anchor institutions. Thank you, Sean. And with that, I'll turn to Cress for some sort of uh, wrap-up overview comments. Cress, you work at the Media and Democracy Coalition and really cover, have to cover, uh, the breadth of what's been discussed here. I'm not sure if you have any reflections on what you've heard as it may be relevant to the audience. Hi, good morning. Um, I think there are three top issues that are coming out in all of these. Um, my position at MADCO, the Media and Democracy Coalition, is the advocacy manager. So I spend a good amount of time trying to keep track of all of these things and also head up to the Hill and the FCC to help advocate for these policies. And uh, I'd like to joke that it's my business to be up in your business. I need to know what's going on. Um, and I think what we need to hear in this room are the top three things that we need to pull away from all of these issues. They're amazing. So I just want to say thanks to our panelists because you really just brought it out in such a way that we could get through it. Um, so the top three things that I'm really seeing in all all of these issues are free and open access, affordability, and diversity. So if we just go through the list very, very quickly, when we talk about net neutrality, this is essentially your livelihood. Um, for those of you that are actually thinking about broadcasting some of your materials online, if net neutrality doesn't exist on wireless, for example, then folks who are trying to access your programming on their mobile devices, um, whether you know they're using their phones, et cetera, may not be able to use it. That's an avenue that is being blocked specifically because the FCC is not really willing to extend those protections to wireless. So once again, that's just about free and open access. Um, and when we talk about affordability, that's things like USF. I personally cannot imagine not having a phone, much less the internet at this point in time. So to say to millions of Americans across the nations that are having trouble affording these types of, um, I'm sorry, uh, technologies is unbelievable. So we have to think of this as a consumer right. We have to think about these protections as consumer protections, the a way for folks to afford um, communicative um, technologies that are really just a part of our everyday lives. And of course, diversity is the third thing that I just wanted to bring up. And that you know comes into things like media ownership um, and the covert consolidation. I don't need to tell you uh, about the, the, the great stuff that's happening in your local communities. You're doing this already, so I'd be preaching to the choir. But we have to understand that if we're not covering the local media, then that means we're basically basically giving up on what's happening in our communities. So with a covert consolidation, I can only imagine if we're talking about two different markets that are receiving the same news simulcast, we don't know who's running for the mayor. I mean, what you basically get with these type of simulcasts are uh, really nice um, pieces on human interest about the dog that was found by you know a, a neighbor across the way. and. And basically, they're, they're also throwing out stories about uh, who got shot up the night before. I mean, it's all very cutesy, um, but it doesn't get to the heart of the matter. It doesn't get to what's happening in your community and what's important and how things go there. So just to help wrap things up, again, we're looking at free and open access. We believe that folks who are in the community movement need, those, need that access. I mean, obviously, everybody needs to be able to access the internet and uh, receive anything that's on there that is lawful uh, without any interference from telecommunications corporations. Affordability, we all should be able to afford these um, telecommunication technologies, phone, internet, it needs to happen. And of course, diversity, we want to make sure um, that our local communities are being covered in such a way that reflects the diversity of the community and the people within it. So that's what I want to say. Thanks, Gus. That's great. Mm -hmm. So we have 
about 12 minutes for questions and some final comments from the panelists who may want to comment on each other's points. Um, uh, we should have a mic going around, Preston. Um, so wait for the mic to come so people who are watching this street live on the web and just to remind everyone this is on the record live and uh, will be streamed for posterity and available to Google and WikiLeaks for as long as they exist. Um, questions, anyone? Around from Hello, I'm Hap Hosh, Executive Director of Public Media Network in Kalamazoo, Michigan, longtime Alliance board member and member. For Ms. Doyle, you alluded to the lessons learned in your 10-year process in the Lower Power FM world, uh, having followed that and participated in it. Um, could you expand on maybe some of the key lessons and, and insights you got from that process and how it would translate to what the Alliance for Community Media is attempting to achieve with the CAP Act? Uh, sure, I can, I can think of a few things off the top of my head and then I'd be happy to talk with you more at length later. Um, one lesson is just the the ten year part that it's a, that it was a long um, a long effort that grew over over um, the efforts of a lot of people all around the country. Um, you know there were there were um, several iterations of the bill that didn't go through, and there was a lot of work in cultivating relationships with um, members of Congress over time, and a lot of work. Um, I mean, I think one of the the key um, uh, the the key components of the success of the Local Community Radio Act was the, the back and forth between the grassroots effort and the Beltway effort. So there was um, a lot of work being done on the grassroots level um, to, to work with um, people who wanted low power FM stations and people who had them. Um, and that's something that the obviously the PEG community can build on is the, the great network that you have all around the country um, to share those stories and success stories um, with your members of Congress. Um, and then there was a back and forth with Beltway groups as well and trying to get information about um, what was going on in Congress and where to put pressure when. And so that, that back and forth process I think was really key for us. Um, I also think that, um, you know, the, the coalition building, the finding, um, finding partners in the community that maybe were not themselves affiliated with the stations, but could see the value of those stations in their communities. So we did a lot of work and a lot of communities to think about who were the grass tops leaders or who were the people that um, would be influential with their members of Congress. Um, and I, I know the next panel will talk more about the grassroots organizing parts um, of this type of work. But um, I think that the, the long-term relationship building and coalition building was really key. And we kind of went back and forth between these long-term um, relationship work and gathering stories and telling compel compelling narratives to the um, putting pressure on in, in key moments where we, you know, just got on the phones and called people all day and we um, uh, came out and, you know, protested in front of, in different stages of the campaign, in front of the National Association of Broadcasters, in front of the FCC, in different, you know, in different places. And so I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, I'll, think about a couple more points to speak with you afterwards, but I think that the um, willingness to look outside of your regular networks to find partners, I mean, I think for, for us, we worked a lot with um, uh, religious organizations. We worked with the U.S. Conference of Catholic, Catholic Bishops. We worked with um, the Christian Coalition at moments. We worked with, you know, emergency responders. Um, and we, we found that there was something across all of these groups that, that they cared about local media and they cared about having, having media access. And so we built strong partnerships with people that, um, that were you know, maybe outside of our networks at the beginning of this campaign that by the end that we had really, I think that that, that sense of, um, of broad support was really helpful in um, convincing members of Congress that this was worth fighting for. So. Thanks, yeah, please. Randy said, which is, um, for those of us who work in the media and technology and public interest communities, um, we're not sprinters. We have to be marathoners. Mm -hmm. it's, it's maybe a sad truth that anything worth doing will not be done quickly in this town in particular. Um, basically, all of the issues that the panelists today have highlighted were um, year, took years and years of effort. 
And I highlight that because I think for those of us who work on these projects, stamina is so important. It is going to be a long haul. And it's easy to get sort of dejected and demoralized, but um, there are some amazing victories that have been won in the process of you know the issues teed up at this table. And I hope hopefully some victories in, in the process right now. Um, so I just say that not as a pep talk, but just it's the reality of how we work in this community and we've, we've done an amazing job, I think. Oh, if I may, I just wanted to touch on what you guys were talking about. Um, as advocacy manager, when you're dealing with folks on the Hill, you have to realize that I can only do my job, we can only do our jobs if you are making noise in your community. So just as Corey mentioned, um, it's basically come to the point where if you can get in touch with your congressman, if you can influence what's happening in your area locally, that's when things really start to happen. Um, without hearing from their constituents, um, congressmen, uh, senators, they tend to do uh, what is easy, meaning there's no noise about it, or number two, um, what corporations and large telecommunication companies are telling them to do. So this is one place where I'm very excited for the next panel. You'll hear more about opportunities for you to uh, do some grassroots organizing in such a way that won't make noise because you know a congressman can easily say hey I can't do it my constituents don't want me to do it or vice versa so this is where this is a place where the power is definitely in your hands yeah I, I just want to follow up on that point really quick that's such an important point because there there are moments in this campaign when even people who were lobbyists in, in DC public interest um, advocates who had good relationships with congressional staffers here couldn't get questions answered or information about what was going on with the legislation that a constituent phone call could get. I mean, the co a constituent call is so valuable. And we would have, you know, we had anonymous holds in the Senate blocking the legislation for a long time, and we, we really pushed to, to, to break those holds. And a lot of times it was, you know, there, there was nothing that we could do inside the Beltway that constituents often could do in terms of really putting pressure. Um, and that, that's, that's a, an important lesson, I think. And, and the other last thing I wanted to add is that if you can think about, in terms of the long haul, if you can think about ways to make the fight itself an organizing opportunity so that even if you don't win this year or next year, you can think about how, how can I, we organize around this issue in a way that's going to strengthen our station or that's going to you know, strengthen our media center or support in our community so that we're not burning out through that process, but that we're, you know, we're building up our community, we're building up community support, and we're building those relationships and coalitions that we can use in other ways as we work towards a bigger victory. Thanks. I think good time for one more question. The gentleman at the front. Hi. Thanks. Jonathan Make at Communications Daily. A uh, question for any of the panelists who want to take it and shot on Skype. Um, what do each of you and your uh, organizations hope to get from the quadrennial uh, media ownership review, since that's something that came up? And then for uh, some of those folks who are saying that maybe some members of Congress and the FCC don't get it on some uh, local telecom issues. How are you hoping to change that as well? Thanks. Um, okay. I'll, I'll start because I've thought a lot about what we want to get out of the Quadrennial Media Ownership Review. Um, I think number one is that coming out of our court case, which we won in July, is there is a very, very powerful mandate from the court instructing the FCC to pay attention to issues of diversity. The court found that the FCC really had not done its job in adopting meaningful policies that would diminish the uh, deficiency in ownership of broadcast stations by people of color and women. Um, and I think that that very powerful mandate in hand, we can go forward and do some really good work at the FCC, uh, which has sadly, I think, not been taken as seriously and as forcefully as it should have in the past. Um, the second really is the covert consolidation issue. Uh, you know, it is not enough that we have to deal with the problems of actual consolidation. Now we have to deal with it on a sort of more secret level. Um, that is incredibly frustrating, but I think it's incumbent on the FCC to recognize this phenomenon uh, and to put some standards in place for what are, uh, are helpful interactions and collaborations. If you want to share a, uh, a news helicopter because an individual station can't afford it on its own, that's fine, but when you take two stations with two separate newsrooms, you move them in together, you lay off the journalists for one station, and you're, you're basically putting duplicate news on the air, that's not useful to the community. It's not a very efficient use of the spectrum, and that could be used for other better purposes. And I think that those are really going to be the signature issues moving forward, and, and we're hoping the FCC will give it the attention that it needs. Thanks. And, uh, 
Sure. Uh, this is Sean. Uh, I would just add that um, we look for proceedings like that review um, to inform the FCC's process of developing appropriate public interest obligations to address the need for localism and diversity. Great. Thanks, Mabinti. I, I would um, just add, and it, it, and it may not be something, I, I guess what we would ask is, is a lot of, is how we can support our public interest partners on this. It is the idea in that review and whether it can fit in there, but the public interest obligations of broadcasters to somehow get away from um, a lot of broadcasters provide weather, sports, and traffic. And there is more to local community information than weather, sports, and traffic. Mm -hmm. It's People want that information, and the Pew, recent Pew study shows that, but um, there should be a way beyond that. As to the question of how to get um, uh, members engaged on these issues, the, I think that the simplest way to do it is you have to just boil it down into the things that they know and understand. I can understand what it means to say, should I make it easier to put up a tower in your community without getting the community's review? That's not that hard to understand. Um, is there a funding source for this? That's not that hard to understand. Is there something other than the corporation which is owned and in a foreign state, if not a foreign country, that has some ability to access infrastructure in the community and get information out? Is there a way for parents to use the computers at elementary schools to access the internet? It's, it's, it's frankly, what's important to do is leave the lawyers and let them write the briefs and the filings, but don't let them write your handouts. I mean, and, and, I, and, and seriously, I mean, people talk about it, but really, if, if, you know, Thanksgiving is around the corner, and as you're sitting there and people ask you, well, what are you working on? You find a way to make whatever it is you're talking about in some understandable chunk. And that's the same thing that needs to happen with the member of Congress. And the one piece that I, I, I would add to this, and I hope that the next panel is going to focus on, is the one thing I think that distinguishes the CAP Act from the low power FM is the CAP Act is much more amenable to adding to another bill. This Congress, maybe the next Congress, they're not particularly interested in doing anything. Um, and it seems shame, shame, I guess it's just shameless about it, about how much money we spend to actually do nothing. Mm -hmm. But that said, this act is revenue, the CAP Act is revenue neutral. It's amenable to adding to a bill. So I hope that that's going to be as part of the next panel and the conversation. And with that last comment from Mitzi, I call this session to a close and thank, ask you to put your hands together and thank all the panelists for excellent and very informing discussion. Thank you.